November 16, 1963. Sandy sat on a log in a forgotten cemetery and pushed her glasses up. She was happy to be out and away from her strict father, a former Navy captain. The little cemetery, no bigger than an acre, was nestled in a forest of giant pine trees by the Cascade Mountains. She told her father she was going to the movies on a double date. Her boyfriend, Andy, and their friends, Peggy and Pete, promised to have her home right after the last showing. Instead, they drove out in the woods for a little fun and drinking. Andy had just given Sandy his class ring. They were going steady now. He and Pete made a little fire in the middle of the cemetery. There were a lot of Italian names on the headstones, but the teens didn't seem to notice. The moss and lichen had covered much of the markers. Vines crept along the ground like spider webs, hiding more. Pete popped open a bottle of Rainier beer, chugged it, then threw it in the fire. And as the fire grew and radio blared, the kids danced around the cemetery, their long shadows bopping across the lot to songs by the Beach Boys, Surfaris, and Little Stevie Wonder. Pete, a little too drunk, tripped and hit a gravestone. It slipped off its foundation and landed on the ground. Andy laughed at his friend, then kicked over the cane headstone. Sandy and Peggy begged them to stop, but the boys picked up rocks and smashed a sarcophagus. Its cover collapsed and exposed a skeleton's leg. Andy roared in laughter at his handiwork. Pete did too. Peggy and Sandy, however, did not approve. The girls began to scold their boyfriends for being so cruel, but stopped. Shadows along the cemetery's edge grew darker. In the woods surrounding them, red eyes appeared and stared. Pete grabbed a discarded beer bottle and threw it into the forest, trying to scare away what he thought were animals. But they weren't animals. The figures approached them. Each lumbering step brought them closer, but you couldn't make out their faces. They were men. Each wore a miner's hat and wore torn, so it stained coveralls. Their skin looked like shiny black rocks, coal, and it smoldered. The kids turned to run down a muddy path back to their car. Sandy slipped on a rock, twisting her ankle and losing her glasses. She grimaced and grabbed her hurt ankle. The mud caked her pink capris. She felt strong arms wrap around her and pull her up. It was Andy. As he lifted her, she felt a burn on her twisted ankle and her skin sizzled. One of the figures had grabbed her by the ankle. It squeezed like a vice and she screamed. Sandy looked down at its hand. Its skin cracked open and glowed orange, like the fire's embers. Sandy scrambled and kicked it in the face with her good leg. The phantom released her, and Andy dragged her down the muddy path to his rambler. As they drove away, Sandy looked out the rear window. She only saw the figures fade into the fire and night. You're listening to Ghostly Activities. I'm your guide, Jacob Rice, and this is Ghosts of Ravensdale. To understand what happened to Sandy and her friends, let's fade back in time to the same day in 1915. The town of Ravensdale sits at the north end of the area's largest coal deposit, not far from the Cedar River in southeast King County. It didn't start off with the name Ravensdale. Leary was its name at first, named after the Leary Coal Company, but that didn't last very long. By the time the coal came from the ground in 1898, it was called Ravensdale, after the birds that ate grain that fell from passing trains. But it wasn't alone. Ravensdale, as we know it now, had a twin city, Georgetown, and the two couldn't be more different. Ravensdale was a company town with a school, doctor's office, and a planned residential area. Georgetown, on the other hand, was a bit wilder, with 11 saloons and three dance halls. You could think of it as a mini Las Vegas. About 1,200 people lived in the combined towns, and you can imagine which side the miners like to go after work. <laughs> and speaking of the miners, 
This little mining town became a draw to young men seeking work from around the world. Most of the 230 miners came from overseas. You'd find Italians, Welshmen, Austrians, Germans, Russians, and Poles swinging pickaxes side by side. Nearby, there were other mining towns extracting coal from the same deposits, Black Diamond, Roslyn, and Franklin. And soon enough, all these towns would be linked by tragedy. At 11 a.m., an electrical hoist broke down, and that would make it difficult to move the coal out of the mines. You see, the mines in Ravensdale were shafts that dropped 1,500 feet straight down into the earth, and you'd need to hoist the carts out, not roll them. Thomas Kane, or TJ as he was known, and the foreman made the decision to keep mine number one open and sent the other miners home until it was fixed. Out of the 230 miners in town, about 150 were scheduled to work. TJ gave 100 men some free time, while the remaining 50 went back to work. TJ then descended to his office at the mine shaft on the third level, 1,500 feet below. At 1.25 p.m., Vera Habenicht and other students in Black Diamond felt a tremor, heard a muffled explosion, and saw smoke billow from Ravensdale's direction seven miles away. All the kids knew what had happened. The same thing had happened in Black Diamond before. But for Vera, it was more than frightening. Her grandfather, Charles Davis, worked in the mine as a pumpman. In Ravensdale, the off-work miners and townsfolk rushed to the mine. Black, toxic smoke burst from the shaft. Within minutes, three survivors from the second level were pulled to safety by rescuers. But the rescuers also made some gruesome discoveries. Three victims, and the main shaft had collapsed. A cave-in where most of the miners would be. For the next 10 hours, the rescue teams made little progress. Toxic smoke, debris, and shattered timbers blocked them from digging. Men would have to wear oxygen helmets like ocean divers would use and work in 90-minute intervals. They'd light a gas lamp and use canaries to tell if they'd run into a deadly gas pocket. If the fire dimmed or the canary went quiet, they'd have to stop or risk another explosion. The wives of the miners stood around the mine opening, hoping their husbands survived. Each time the rescuers found a body, one would fetch a blanket to cover it. One miner's dog also kept watch and would run up and sniff each body to find out if it was his master. The women and the little scruffy dog held vigil for the length of the rescue, each providing comfort to the other as rescuers pulled out more victims. T.J. Kane, the foreman, was one of the first victims removed from the third level. The blast had shattered his office door and desk. He had soot around his nostrils, indicating he took one last breath before he died. The day after the blast, six bodies were recovered and taken to a makeshift morgue at the Ravensdale Hotel. The victims were so mangled and burned, the rescuers didn't want the widows to see them. The blast was so ferocious, it tore several men apart and drove rocks and coal into the victim's burned skin. One widow, Mrs. Charles Davis, a lady near 60, made tea for the rescuers. Like many family members of the trapped miners, she and her husband were immigrants to Washington. They came from mining country in Wales and followed the work where it led them. She and Charles had eight children together. She and Charles had buried their four boys together. They died in mining tragedies too. Now their father was a victim. Charles was the oldest victim at 63. It took six days to retrieve all the men 31 died in the blast, including Vera's grandfather. There were no survivors from the third level. The tragedy left 25 widows, 60 children without fathers, and a town that would need a century to heal. Men lined a muddy, potholed road in the rain. Some were miners from Ravensdale, and others came from Black Diamond, Franklin, and Roslyn. They came to fix the broken road to the cemetery, a one-acre lot buried deep in the woods. It would become busy with funeral processions over the next week. 
T.J. Kane was one of the first to be buried there. Many miners' bodies were sent back home to their original countries. As for Charles Davis, his burial site is lost to time. An inquest began a few days after the blast. No definitive reason was ever found, but there are some clues to what caused the explosion. The Ravensdale mine was known as a dry mine, which means it had very little moisture in it. That let explosive coal dust build in the mine shafts. The Northwest Improvement Company installed sprinklers in the mine to help reduce the dust, but it had only been active for two days preceding the explosion. It wasn't enough to prevent a random explosion, and the coroner also found matches, matchboxes, and pipes on some men. It would only take a small spark to set off a gas pocket, ignite the coal dust, and trigger a bigger explosion from the dynamite kept in the mine. The inquest ended without declaring a reason. As for the families, they received $4,000 in compensation for the married men, and single men got slightly less. A total of $124,000, or just over $700,000 in today's money, was paid out, and a significant amount of donations flowed in from unions, labor groups, and nearby communities. Even students from Queen Anne Sunday School sent $3.12 from their collection plate. The Northwest Improvement Company closed the mine after the accident. They moved the equipment and operations to Roslyn, a town that had the worst mining disaster in Washington's history. 45 men died in an 1892 explosion. Ravensdale's population plummeted after the work left. It fell from 1,200 to less than 200 within a few years. With no work, the remaining miners left for other mines, worked in local sawmills, or joined the military to fight in World War I. At some point in the 1920s, Ravensdale failed to renew its incorporation status and dissolved. It remained a community in spirit, but no longer on the map. The fortune of other mining towns in Washington began to suffer during this time. Oil and natural gas became the dominant sources of energy. It cost less than coal to develop, but coal and Ravensdale weren't dead yet. In 1924, another mining operation started up. The Dale Coal Company started mines along the Danville, Landsberg, and McKay coal seams. It shut down in 1941. Two other mining companies tried again during the 1940s, but each failed. The last company, the Palmer Coking Coal Company, continued until 1975. A week before Christmas, it dynamited shut the last underground coal mine in Washington. The company also suffered a mining disaster in 1955, when four miners drowned in the Landsberg mine. Ravensdale hung on over the next 50 years. Today, its population has recovered to its 1915 peak. It's a bedroom community to Seattle and Tacoma, both 45 minutes away. In 2015, one century later, the community placed a marker with the names and faces of the lost miners near the cemetery, the one that was desecrated in 1963. Andy pulled up to Sandy's house and helped her out of the car. She stumbled from her hurt ankle. As they approached her front door, her father opened it. He was an imposing figure, over six feet and just as muscled as he was during his World War II days. He looked at his daughter, her muddy clothes, lost glasses, and burned ankle, and his face turned red. He shook with anger and stared at Andy. Andy tried to explain. Sandy tried to interject, but their words were canceled with a terse, shut up, from her father. He had a low, smooth voice, but it cracked with rage. Sandy's father shoved Andy down on the concrete front stairs and raised his fist. He paused and held it while leering at the boy. And then he stepped back and lowered it. His face relaxed, and he took a deep breath. He told Andy, to never see his daughter again, never drive down this street, and never call. Sandy clasped the ring her boyfriend gave her, but her father yanked it, breaking the clasp 
and threw it at Andy. Leave now, was the last thing her father said as he grabbed Sandy by her wrist and pulled her inside the house. Sandy never said a word to Andy again. They'd exchanged looks in hallways during their final year at high school, but never snuck out to see each other. Never had a secret phone call at Peggy's. And Sandy never dated another boy. In 1967, she left King County and moved to the East Coast. Peggy and Pete got married after high school and left for California. He joined the Army, but died in 1968 while fighting in the Vietnam War. Sandy never knew what happened to Peggy after that. And Andy, he went to work for his father's lumber company, got married in the early 70s, had a couple of kids, and lived a happy life. Sandy found out he died of pancreatic cancer in 2010. Sandy now lives in Virginia along Chesapeake Bay, but her memory is starting to fade. Alzheimer's disease runs in her family, and she inherited it from her mother. This is the first time she's told the story to anyone. When someone asks about the scar on her ankle, the memories come back, but they're no longer as vivid. Her memories of Andy, Peggy, and Pete may not be so reliable anymore. They're getting gray and fuzzy, fading away like the ghosts of Ravensdale. Special thanks to Melissa Becker for additional research into the Ravensdale mine disaster.